My name is Professor Colmo Kaneda. I'm a um, professor here in uh, Constitutional Human Rights Law. It's my immense pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to what is unbelievably our 11th annual Bynumans UCL event. Um, we here in the UCL Faculty of Laws, we greatly value this event. It's, uh, it's a unique collaboration between Feynman's and ourselves, and we very much value the association. It's given us 11 years of wonderful debates, controversial, provocative, rigorous, fascinating, and I'm absolutely sure that tonight will be no, um, no, no different. Um, Bindman's are, I was, I was talking to a few Bindman's partners earlier, and I was asking how would you like to present yourselves, and they were being a little bit modest. It's probably fair to say what I tell my students, that if you're interested in human rights, if you're interested in um, public law matters, if you're interested in legal cases with a sort of social justice angle, then you couldn't do better trying to, I emphasize trying to, perhaps if you're very, very lucky, getting a job in Bindman's because they are one of the, if not the leading um, law firm working in that area, indeed in other areas in the country. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. Um, first of all, we have four exits. I can never get the air stewardess physical descriptions right, but we have basically two here on this side, two here above and below. Okay, so four exits. Bathrooms are out this side and to the left. If there's a fire alarm, you very definitely will know about it. We will have fire marshals on standby to give you instructions as to where to go, but as usual, you evacuate the place in an orderly manner, leaving your material possessions behind, and do what you're told is the simplest instruction in that respect. Um, the, this debate is going to be recorded and will be available, um, will be available online as soon as we can get it up online but you will be all informed in an email if you've, you've registered to attend so you will be informed as to when that will be available so you can replay it over and over to your, um, to your heart's content. Um, we have a wide diversity of sectors and views represented in the audience this evening so we've structured the debate so that you have both great input from our four panelists here, and then also we're hoping to leave lots of time for the audience to get involved in the discussion. Um, tweeting will be ongoing under the hashtag, at, under the hashtag UCL Bindman's and also prevent. Um, that's enough of my announcements. I'll be coming back to you at the very end. Thank you for coming and to, and to let you know about a reception that's happening afterwards in the North, North Cloisters in the main UCL campus. But without further ado, I'll now hand you over to our chair for this evening. Um, our chair is um, David Anderson QC from Brick Court Chambers. Um, there's a lot one could say about David. Um, it's, it's, I think, very briefly, he's one of the, if not the, since I'm showering out legal compliments this evening, one of the leading um, barristers in the area of constitutional law, human rights law, and European law. He has, since 2011, been the independent reviewer of um, anti-terrorism legislation. He also, as I discovered this evening, um, has been recently awarded the rather questionable accolade of Legal Personality of the Year 2015. He must have beaten off stiff competition for that. So, without further ado, I'll hand you over to David to take the proceedings forward. Well, thank you very much, uh, Colm. I review the counter-terrorism laws. I don't review uh, Prevent, but everywhere I go, people want to talk about it. <laughs> And, and I'm absolutely delighted that Bindman's and UCL have uh, gathered together not only such an illustrious panel, uh, but panel, a panel that I think has a real range of experiences and who knows, maybe even a real range of views. The, the format is going to be 10 minutes each, and that's going to be rigorously enforced. No one's going to get any longer than that. Uh, but they have uh, 10 minutes each to make their case. And then we'll open it up to questions. We'll probably do the questions in little groups and then um, see who wants to, to comment on them. Um, I'll introduce them all at the start. Um, you may have a, a longer introduction somewhere in front of you, so I won't uh, take time over it. But in order of speaking, uh, we're going to start uh, with Simon Cole. Uh, he is the Chief Constable of Leicestershire, 
uh, uh, but not only that, he has been the National Police Lead on Mental Health and Disability, and he is currently the National Police Lead both on local policing and on Prevent. So uh, very much uh, where it's at from the police point of view. Uh, we're then going to uh, Malia uh, Boitier, who in the uh, well-worn cliché needs uh, no introduction. Um, so the introduction uh, will be very short. She's currently Black Students Officer of the National Union of Students. She's uh, affiliated to the uh, University of uh, Birmingham. She also leads the Students Not Suspects campaign. And as you will all know, she is the president uh, designate of the National Union of Students, um, about to take office in a, a couple of weeks' time. Um, we then go on my right to uh, Anjum Khan. Uh, he is the director of, a, of a, a group called Collaborative Ventures. He's a person-centered existential therapist who's worked for eight years uh, in uh, Prevent, both as a Prevent coordinator as, and also as an intervention provider. Uh, he works in youth offending and children social care. And then last but not least, uh, we have Mick Versi. Uh, on my left, he's um, Assistant Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, uh, where I've got to know him uh, uh, pretty well. Um, uh, you may well know him from uh, articles he's written in The Independent, The Guardian, uh, and other uh, publications, and I'm almost certain you'll have seen him on uh, TV. He's also a board member of uh, the human rights organisation Rights Watch UK. Well, without further ado, uh, Simon, you have 10 minutes starting now. <laughs> All right, thank you. I, so I'm not quite sure how I won going first. It just sort of happened while we were having a cup of tea. I'm going to try and put some context around uh, threat level and things like that. And I apologise I got this, but I'm of an age where I've got very focals. And when I put it on the table, I could barely see the paper, let alone what I was supposed to be saying. I guess the local policing bit that David just alluded to is really important because conceptually, where I'm coming from is... We police with local communities, that is quite a challenge, uh, but that concept, concept has lasted since Peel uh, in 1829 or whatever, just down the road from here. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to come here. And we, you know, we've got to answer a question, does prevent uh, uh, guidance, prevent extremism or promote prejudice? And I guess my answer would be that enables us to safeguard those who may be about to, about to make decisions that harm themselves or others. And it does that whoever they are and where they're from. Just to explain my role, I am the chief of Leicestershire. I used to then do a spiel about Richard III and Alice Hawkins as a suffragette. I now just say that, yes, somehow they did win the premiership and that immediately <laughs> grounds that um, and people know where I'm from in a way they just didn't before. But for policing nationally, I lead our work on prevent as well as being chief of Leicestershire and the duty to have due, due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism sits with us as it does with other agencies but of course I guess where we're different is if you step beyond that line into a place where you're committing offences that's ours too. The context for me I guess is that in the 27 plus years that I've been a cop I have seen acts of terror committed all over the world by people of every race, faith, colour and creed. As a young PC I used to patrol Birmingham and I would be told about the horror of the pub bombings. As a chief now, I hear as I go around my business about Syria, I hear about Pakistani school children being murdered in playgrounds, of Nigerian girls being kidnapped, of British citizens shot on a Mediterranean beach, of people dancing in a disco in America, dying on the dance floor. Over the weekend, uh, a French police officer and his partner being killed outside their own home or inside their own home and the attacks on European cities that we would all see. So the threat level is currently severe, that means an attack is highly likely and then there is a subtext to that which is for Northern Ireland the threat level is substantial which means an attack related to Northern Irish terrorism is a strong possibility. Um, the world has changed. So AQ were a small, elitist, concentrating on relatively rare mass casualty attacks. Daesh is different, it's large, it seeks to create a, a state that's actually functioning and it has a very sophisticated and slick uh, propaganda and information arm trying to engage people. Um, and, and there's some crude <coughs> paraphrasing which I hope you'd excuse, but, but the message there is, you know, come out to Syria, 
And if you can't, do something yourself wherever you are. Um, and that's a direct appeal being made at present. And potentially over the weekend and the last couple of days, we've seen examples of that uh, in America and Europe. Um, the scale of the PR machine for Daesh is huge with massive viewership. So some of the propaganda that's put out within 48 hours of release has been seen by 150,000 people. Massive. So however half people are tweeting in the crowd, they will be hard pressed to match that. So that is the risk. And as a cop, that's where my risk uh, parameters start. Um, last year, in the last year, 315 people arrested for terrorist offences, an increase of a third from the previous year. Um, and Terrorism-related offences? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think I probably nicked that from one of your reports, actually. Yeah, it was a difference. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, somewhere around 800 people have travelled to Syria, around half have returned, and around probably 10% of those have been killed. Um, and you know, there's a variety of, of, of cases that have made the national news. I won't rehearse them partly so I can meet the challenge of time. So from a police point of view, communities are the things that defeat the kind of problems that police officers deal with. And in this context, communities will be terrorism. And then the, the government, and I'm the police, which is slightly different to the government, I would say, have then place the duty and widen the duty which builds on the previous statutory, uh, uh, sorry, which builds on the previous policy and turned it into a statutory duty, I think to try and improve a consistency of delivery and the duty is on governing bodies to make sure that they're identifying policies that deal with potential threats and they work in partnership and that their staff are trained. Um, it's already been alluded to by, by David. Um, one of the things I find intriguing is the kind of level of concern and anger <coughs> that prevent can attract. Sometimes about things that I would say that actually aren't, strictly speaking, prevent, and I will come to that. But for me, prevent's about protecting individuals from the risk of harm to themselves, to their families, to others. Um, and that's really important. You know, real recent case, young man, teenager, I have a teenage son that has its own pleasures and merits and demerits, but a young man, same age as my son actually, expressed to his St John's ambulance class the desire to travel to Syria and use his first aid skills to treat people. They were concerned. They did talk to their local prevent team. They reflected on how to help and support that individual. They felt he misunderstood some of the uh, ethoses that he was being presented with. The school were engaged and the school felt that compared to other members of the family, he was behaving differently and performing differently. What was put in place around that was mentoring. A mentoring intervention that allowed that individual to get support, to help them understand and develop and make their own decisions. And within six months of that, a noticeable shift in attitude and approach and an improved performance at school. He did not go and has not gone to Syria. That's the kind of operational bit that PREVENT is about. And the key thing, I think, is it's a voluntary scheme. And I think sometimes that gets lost along the way. It is a voluntary scheme that is offered to people to give them an opportunity to make decisions about their own lives. Within that as well, 10 to 20 percent of the referrals in large chunks of the country are about right-wing extremism. Those referrals, I would say, in general, and you'll have to excuse me generalising, are about community cohesion more than essentially direct terrorism, but they have a kind of unsettling effect and you get this kind of cycle of reciprocal radicalisation and the stakes go up. How long have I got? Two minutes, right, two minutes. So, let's not lose sight of two things. Prevents a product of 
a democratic process, and we'll all have our different views about that, but we shouldn't lose sight of it. And I'll just reinforce the fact that prevent is voluntary. You know, it is not a scheme that has compulsion with it, and we'll potentially hear a bit more about that. I just want to touch on, in closing, on context. This does not sit on its own. And actually, David very kindly came up and met some of the local communities that I worked with, and we heard about Schedule 7 stops at airports. We heard about foreign policy. We heard about terrorism act powers. We heard about detention powers. We heard about Islamophobia. We heard about the role of the media and a wider world. Those things all play across prevent, but they aren't actually prevent. So, in concluding, I'm sure as we explore and take questions and try and develop how do we take safeguarding and keeping people secure forwards, we will no doubt hear some concerns, challenges, they might be pretty robust. In 2015 into 16, there have been hundreds of people supported through multi-agency referral and consequent activity and mentoring through prevent referrals. There have been about 25,000 people attend sessions to help them to do that and about 60,000, just short of 60,000 pieces of terrorist-related materials removed from the internet and the like. So, concluding, I absolutely accept we, the police, because we are but part of this, need to be more transparent about what we do. We need to ensure that the process of what actually happens and actually manifests itself as usually pretty well-trained, pretty empathetic individual people, <coughs> supporting people who are vulnerable is seen as that. We need to explore the link into mental health because some of the work we've been doing recently suggests somewhere around half of those early referrals may have mental health issues and we need to be really clear in having dialogue that prevent is helping to safeguard people. Often people who are pretty vulnerable and it's helping them to make good decisions. Their voluntary decisions help make us all safer. We need to do that with people. Simon, thanks very much. Malia, over to you. Uh, entirely up to you. Do you want, do you want the letter? No. Sure. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to Vimans for organising this event today and to you all for coming. Um, so, following uh, a vote at its national conference in 2015, uh, the National Union of Students has been quite instrumental in the new wave of opposition against Prevent and the Counterterrorism and Security Act, with the Students Not Suspects campaign actively shaping um, the discourse around Prevent within the education sector in particular. Our position has been met and matched by all manners of bodies across the sector, most recently with the Universities and Colleges Union voting to reaffirm their opposition to Prevent and their an at their annual conference uh, this month and with the National Union of Teachers voting unanimously uh, at their annual conference to call for a withdrawal uh, of the so-called prevent duty from schools a few months ago. <coughs> also recently, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights uh, and Fundamental Freedoms uh, while countering terrorism spoke in his annual report on the dangers of educators being made to serve as watchdogs or intelligence officers under various states uh, counter-terrorism legislation, as well as the growing tendency to criminalize dissenting but otherwise peaceful views as extreme, both criticisms which can and have been leveled directly against PREVENT. Yet, in the face of this growing discontent and the drive to have PREVENT repealed, uh, we have the government defensive of PREVENT and looking to entrench it even further within the upcoming uh, counter-extremism and safeguarding bill. And so it's within this context that we're having this debate today. Um, but whilst it's centred around the effectiveness or lack thereof of prevent, there are also a few uh, interrelated issues around it that I want to address. Much of this is due to the fact that the recent campaigning around prevent has brought to light many cases uh, and much about the strategy that has long been uh, spoken about behind closed doors amongst victims. And this campaigning has also brought out many shades of opinion uh, and opposition around Prevent. I don't think there's anyone really sitting uh, either on this panel or in the audience that honestly believes that Prevent doesn't have its issues. 
Uh, I'm sure neither of the, the members of the panel would suggest as much, and I'm sure they're of the opinion there are perhaps problems with implementation that stop Prevent being as effective as it could be in their eyes. So firstly, I think we need to address exactly uh, how we determine how effective Prevent has been or could be. In sum, Prevent cannot be evaluated uh, on its stated objectives because by definition, Prevent seeks to deal with things that haven't even happened yet. No one can claim to be able to identify a success rate for prevent referrals for this reason. Of all the many thousands of people who have been referred to channel for being so-called at risk, no one can profess uh, to knowing how many of them actually headed towards committing acts of political violence and how many of these were actually deterred from doing so as a result of prevent, if at all. Of the attacks within the UK that have been averted over the last decade, uh, most, if not all, were stopped as a result of intelligence-based policing where evidence was available, uh, empirical, and, um, and acted upon, so no credit can actually be given to PREVENT. This is because PREVENT is not guided by intelligence or statistical evidence, nor does it look to deal with criminal activity. It's a program which looks to criminalise particular thought processes assumed to lead assumed to lead to criminal activity down the line. As a counter-terrorism program, PREVENT cannot prove either success or failure. But as a political project, PREVENT has served another pur purpose. It's meant that the state can easily clamp down on dissent, um, as we've seen numerous times in the cases of Palestine or anti-fracking activists being referred under the duty, which then brings me to the point about public perceptions of PREVENT. Again, no one here I trust will deny that PREVENT is divisive, with the gulf uh, between government and communities growing even wider over the issue. It's on this basis that David Anderson um, has, has called for a review of PREVENT. For a strategy which relies on community buy-in and normalization to be successful, the fact that the Times last year found that only 10% of the referrals to PREVENT uh, coming from within the Muslim community just adds to the failures that define PREVENT. It's a strategy that has been uh, all but rejected by the people it claims to work uh, most on behalf of. Some might believe that this is mainly down to poor communication. What if the government uh, invested more in properly explaining the, what Prevent actually was? Then, you know, surely it would function better. What this argument fails to recognize is that Prevent relies on the ambiguity of its guidelines and public anxiety. The guidelines to teachers and lecturers, for example, ask them to look out for relevant mental health issues and desire for political and moral change and feelings of grievance and injustice. Um, this is also best captured in the fact that 10 years on, the government is still unable to define the core concept of, ex of extremism that is central to PREVENT. PREVENT exists in the space where sense fails and fear prevails. Some long overdue validation uh, of our efforts have come last year when uh, Dal Babu, uh, the former chief superintendent of the Met Police, and more recently Andy Burnham, the Shadow Home Secretary, described Prevent as a toxic brand. Prevent is not just toxic, it's corrosive. The Muslim communities still uh, recovering from the fracture driven by Prevent pay testament to this, as do the many broken families and unspoken uh, individual traumas but we need to go beyond just addressing the brand of PREVENT as being the issue, as if the, a repackaged form of the strategy is any solution. PREVENT is the tip of the problem, but just singularly tackling the strategy as we know it is not enough. It's not just PREVENT per se, but the whole philosophy uh, of securitization and surveillance ushered in by the war on terror, from the vast state apparatus designed to monitor and track citizens in the UK, uh, to fear-mongering used by the government to mask the steady erosion of our civil liberties to the racist assumptions built into society and the media and the state in their uh, interactions with Muslims in the UK today. So again, if PREVENT aims to splinter and frag fragment communities, polarise society and erase nuance, then yes, it can be deemed successful. By any other, by any other metrics, PREVENT has failed. So I'm under no illusions, better PR, tweaks and reforms are not enough. What, we, what needs to be done now is for PREVENT to be dismantled and uprooted. Over the last 10 years of its existence, PREVENT has assumed many guises, depending on the government of the day, PREVENT is either about community cohesion, Muslim women's empowerment, or more recently safeguarding and British values in colleges. 
indeed prevents legitimacy, um, as of late, has hinged on its blurring of the lines between welfare and counter-extremism. And the vote taken by the National Union of Teachers in March against the prevent duty of the, of the counter and Security Act was especially powerful for directly confronting the idea that prevent is being, is being a, ne a necessary part of safeguarding and for having those most trusted with our children's protection and welfare, our teachers uniformly oppose the ideal that spying on them is the best way to ensure our children's safety. It's due to this new turn towards safeguarding that the skyrocketing figures of young school-aged children being referred to prevent, now constituting over half of the referrals, can be attributed. It's a vital step, therefore, for teachers to help puncture this argument and hopefully begin putting an end to the practice which has seen prevents most insidious side revealed. With cases like those of, Mah of, of Rama Mohammed, who's in the audience, harassed by prevent officers for his pro-Palestinian activism at his college, at his high school, or the eco-terrorism boy uh, referred simply for using uh, the word l'eco-terrorisme in his French class, which you know should have been commended for because great vocab uh, knowledge <laughs> there. Um, you know, there are a number of other cases being made public which help highlight that perhaps um, what's been missing thus far amidst the the, the slinging of statistics back and forth, that of the very human fallout from Prevent and the very human tragedy wrought by it. Um, I, I think I'll probably end it there because I'm way over my time and I'll come back to the argument. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maria. Anjum, over to you. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, hello. My name's Anjum Khan. Um, I'm a as I introduce a qualified uh, counsellor. I've had two main roles in my eight years' experience of working within Prevent. I'm not, uh, I don't work for the Home Office at the moment or any local authority. I'm a consultant within Prevent. And my experience has been to support and vulnerable individuals, support and community as part of the Prevent strategy. Firstly, my role is at the moment currently is as an intervention provider working within Prevent and Channel. So Channel is a referral and support mechanism for those who have become vulnerable to extremism and radicalization. The second role that I've had as a, was as a prevent coordinator in London Borough of Ealing. The role involved delivery of channel, the intervention referral mechanism, and also delivering community projects within Ealing Borough Council. Building relationships, supporting community-based projects, projects 130 projects which have reached 25,000 people last year. These are funded by the Home Office, by local councils and other organisations. These projects include community-led project pro community projects that build critical thinking skills amongst young people and schools and helping parents to better understanding how the internet works so they can monitor the use of their children. Some of the community organisations that work in Prevent are in the audience today, and we may have a chance to speak to them a bit later, and they will also explain some of the work we do. Now, channel, however, is a main area of my focus, and I'll explain some of the channel processes and how we support these vulnerable people. Channel is a multi-agency, multi-discipline safeguarding process. It is, uses Two, three types of intervention which are mentoring, theological support, or mental health support. Channel is a voluntary program as mentioned previously by Simon. It's up to individual or the parents to decide whether to take advantage of the support it offers. It is not a criminal or civil sanction. Channel has received referrals from a range of people concerned about individuals' well-being, including from schools, health, social care and communities. It is confidential. Participants will not show up at any checks or negatively affect an individual's future in any way. So where did Channel come from? Channel. I started my career actually as a, in the pilot borough of Channel in Lambeth. The other borough that piloted Channel was Preston in Lancashire. Our role in Lambeth was to model Channel in the same way that other multi-discipline, multi agency referral mechanism designed to support vulnerable individuals such as children safeguarding, child protection panels, yacht panels and assessment mechanism work. The same sort of function but brought in other concepts of culture and religion. This is where the sticking point usually comes about. 
You must remember that Prevent and subsequently Channel came on the back of the London terrorist attacks in 2005. However, Channel also works with far-right referrals and lesser extent Sri Lankan and Sikh extremism. I believe that my role as a Muslim in both piloting Channel and as an intervention provider and as a Prevent coordinator is vital and cannot be misunderstood. Without Muslims informing and delivering Prevent, and other safeguarding referrals and support mechanisms, there will be a greater chance of misunderstanding and inappropriate referral within a service for adult and children. Muslim representation in prevent or policing, education, social care is essential <coughs> to ensure prevent works effectively. My role as an intervention provider, I've engaged and supported about 50 channel cases, including cases linked to London attacks and children and adults who have travelled to Syria and Iraq to fight with extremist groups such as Daesh, Al-Qaeda and other linked groups. I not, not, I not only deal with individuals but sometimes also their families as part of a wider holistic approach to tackling radicalisation. We, I mean myself and other intervention <coughs> providers, who some of them are here also in the audience, support vulnerable individuals with their theological mental health or mentoring support, as I mentioned previously. Not only do we support our own community, we also provide training and guidance to counter-terrorism officers, channel members, and other people of communities. It is important to help widen the understanding and the contextualization of terms and issues within religions and culture. So our role within that is essential. We work within different schools of thought, Sunni, Shia, and more importantly, new Muslims converts or reverts, whichever terminology you like to use. I have another colleague of mine here, Ismail Lee South, who's here from um, Salam Project, a project that supports and prevents, amongst other things, to help ensure converts aren't drawn into extremism. Mainstream Islam does not always have a place and time for marginalised groups who may find the same prejudice in Islam as they face outside Islam. For me, prevent is about safeguarding protecting individuals, often vulnerable individuals, young people at risk of harm, both to themselves, their families and the wider society. In my years and experience, one of the cases that sticks in most in my mind is a young Somali boy who has autism. His family did not control his use of internet. He came to the belief that committing suicide was an Islamic trait. At one point, he tried killing himself by running in front of a car. Because of his autism, he developed an infatuation with Daesh. He was not subsequently ostracised by his peers and his community. I worked with this boy for over two years. We worked collaboratively with his school, his family, and all services available to channel within that borough. We helped him to move from his obsession with extremism so that he could lead a more normal life as a child. Eventually, we helped him to address his obsession with extremism. We helped him integrate into a secondary school with a very positive Muslim teacher as a role model and mentor. We close the case with him and his family leading to a much safer and normalised life. Prevent doesn't just deal with Islamic extremism cases. My colleague Nick Danes, a specialist in far-right intervention cases, myself and Nick work with boroughs all ranging from Essex coast all the way to South and West Wales. Over half the cases in West and South Wales are far-right extremists. It may interest you to know that there are new groups within Wales, such as National Action White, a white supremacist group, who are graduates and educated people, who, who are out and motivated and want to cleanse Britain of migrants and not just Muslims. Another case that I would like to bring to you about the implication of and the effect of Daesh is currently working with a boy who's deaf, and he went online to convert to Islam linking Islamic State, the word Islamic State, with becoming a Muslim. And he wanted to marry a Muslim girl. He was recruited online by Daesh with a website using the language which had a sign language interpreter. My support with him involves helping him understand that Daesh are not a representative of Islam and that finding identity and love can happen without being linked to extremism. The third and final case I liked to bring to you is about a girl and a family that I'm supporting 
The girl who travelled to Syria to join Daesh, without her family's knowledge, just like the three girls from Bethnal Green, she was groomed in a bedroom without her parents' knowledge. The girl called her family to say, I am in here in Syria to get you all to heaven. She had been groomed in believing that Daesh was part of her religion. Her parents told her that what she has done has put, her, put them in hell. She now wants to return back to the UK. This is a tragic case where radicalisation has resulted in the breakup of a family. For me, this shows that the prevent isn't the target of Muslims, it is terrorism recruiters that target Muslims. The main point I would like to make about these cases is that these individuals we support are our clients. I am a therapist. We provide a voluntary support in a non-criminal space. It isn't about spying, as some people claim. We don't accuse teachers of spying when asking them to protect children with child sexual exploitation, domestic violence, gangs and bullying, or any other issue that we expect in frontline staff to be aware of. Teachers have always played a, such a role, but given the radicalization a fairly new phenomenon, they've been, they're asking us for support. We want to know more about radicalization and how it fits into with their safeguarding role, not just to say it's safeguarding, just get on with it. The government is working and providing teachers with the support. For example, earlier this year we launched an Education Against Hate Crime website, and more recently a public, publicly accessible prevent e-learning tool. When you have a large number of people working on an agenda, whether it's policing, social work, preventing extremism, some people, they are, and they are only human, will make mistakes. Some people overreact, and some people just don't, have, don't know how to do, do their job very well. This is a minority. Most professionals do get it. The Francis report looked at the failings of Staffordshire hospitals and did not suggest we stop using hospitals or GPs. The report was there to inform and change and address the failings and move forward for the NHS and for patients. The prevent duty has been for us with us for less than a year. Let us take one of the sectors covering prevent duty, schools. There are 430,000 teachers in the UK and 22,000 schools. How many controversial cases has there been? A small handful at that. This shows that PREVENT is being applied sensibly, proportionately, and vast majority of professionals, and despite some critics, critics suggest. Exceptional <coughs> cases and mistakes have been made and do not prove the general rule. I'm sure PREVENT can improve. There has been room for improvement. I've seen firsthand that PREVENT cases can change people's lives for better. I was working with an offender who was released following a conviction of a terrorist-related offence. I was asked to see if he had really changed. One conversation I remember about him that really stands out, I said, he said to me that he fears that one day he will have to stand in front of Allah on Judgment Day and answer to Allah and the families of those of people he radicalised and he was sent to fight. This is an example of the cases we're working with. Thanking, thank you today for allowing me to speak. We've never been allowed before to come forward and speak. And also, this is not just me speaking, this is also the voice of some of the victims that we work with. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> thank you very much uh, to all the speakers as well and, and for Bynemans for making this possible. Uh, just, I would like to step back a little bit. In the last 10 years, uh, Three people have been killed from terrorism offences here in the UK. About 30 have been killed in Northern Ireland for terrorism-related offences. It's just worth noting these figures just to keep our context in place. Hundreds of thousands have been killed in Syria and other places in the world where state terror has been a real driver of what's happening. Worth keeping that context in mind when we're talking about this. And obviously we're here in the UK. There is a real threat. Nobody can doubt it. And we need to try and find a way, how do we most effectively deal with a threat that is facing us? There have been 100 people killed in Paris, 50 in Orlando. This is a real threat that we're worried about, all of us here in the, in the, in the room and across the world. Now, when there is a real threat, why don't we look at history? The International Commission of Jurists, this is a, a UN body which looked at this in 15 countries in the world. And in every country, when they talked about the terror threat that they faced, the ICJ found the same response. 
This is an exceptional situation. It's different from what it was before. We don't need to look at what's happened before. But instead here, that's exactly what's being said again. That this is a different threat. Now, we realize that the same strategy that is being put in place here in England and Scotland and Wales is not being used in Northern Ireland. Why is that the case? Again, the idea is that this is an exceptional threat. So let's look at the real examples. We've talked about people going to Syria. We've talked about people who are individuals who are committing acts of terror because they are inspired by people in, elsewhere in the world. And we have groups which are here, which are problematic. So those are the three things. And keep that in mind when we look at prevent going forward. And the problem is, it's not that prevent is not tackling these real threats very well. It is talking about a broader issue and has many bad consequences. And the three consequences I want to talk about are the fact that, number one, it has this idea of stigmatizing religion as a precursor to terrorism. And I'll talk about what I mean in that in a second. The second area is this idea that it is policing our thinking because it's got such a wide idea of what extremism is. Prevent the, 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 the strategy is about tackling extremism, what is called non-violent extremism, because this is seen as a means to get to violent extremism. And I'll talk about how that very wide definition has so far-reaching consequences for many people in this country. And the third area is the fact that it, as a whole, targets Muslim communities more than others. Of course, they're far-right um, extremists who are, who are brought in. But Muslims are targeted, or definitely perceived to be targeted, and facts will show that they are. And the problem with this is that we want something that's effective. We want something that's evidence-based. We want something that will really make a difference and not something that's counterproductive that, will make the, that has the risk of making the situation worse. So let's talk about the first idea that I mentioned. The idea that religion, or there is this conveyor belt theory which talks about non-violent extremism. You become some sort of form of extremist and then you're more likely to become a violent extremist. Now, a, a Whitehall paper marked restricted by the government, said, we do not believe it is accurate to regard radicalization in this country as a linear conveyor belt from grievance, radicalization to violence, because it misreads the radicalization process and it gives undue weight to ideological factors. The reality is academics and everybody is saying the same thing. We have to be very careful about thinking and oversimplifying this issue. Charles Farr, who's Theresa May's right-hand man on this, has talked about the, war the risk of oversimplifying this issue and saying that if someone is a conservative Muslim, that means they're more likely to be an uh, a violent extremist later. But guess what? That's very much what has happened. We've had leak after leak talking about this. Um, very recently, only a few months ago, um, there was a, an expose in the right-wing press which talked about how, how someone of a Dio Bundy background, that's one one school of thought within Islam, if you like, a theological way of thinking. If you are the Obandi, you cannot be in line with British values. You are always going to be an extremist. Now, this is the kind of dangerous thinking that, that is very worrying, because that was then seen as something that needs to be tackled within prisons. Now, what we have to try and do is move away from that. So this whole idea that there is this conveyor belt from non-violent extremism, to violent extremism is problematic at its very core. Academics don't support it, and it's worrying because if you start going down that route, it has a lot of far-reaching consequences. And the problem with that is very much accentuated by the very definition of extremism, which is my second point. Now, the definition of extremism, as you may be aware, but I will repeat for you here, is the vocal or active opposition to fundamental British values that are democracy, rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance of those other beliefs or faiths. Now, we should be confident in who we are. The fact whether these are British values or universal values, putting that aside for a moment, we can be confident in who we are and having these values. Of course we are. There's no problem in that. But let's just be clear on this. When the prime minister meets the Chinese premier, or the Egyptian dictator, or the Bahraini king, or bows to the Saudi dictators? Is he cohorting with extremists? 
Should he be dealt with in that way? I don't know. I mean, I think there's a clear answer to that. We have to be very worried when there is a situation where the idea of extremism is looked at in this way. Let's consider the idea of dictatorship. The idea this is a fundamental value. And of, I mean, very much uh, part of it, love the fact that we talk about dictatorship. But I I've, I've, was at university and I have friends who talk about, um, they'd studied philosophy, politics and economics at university. And they talk about their love for Plato's idea for benevolent dictatorship. They, very, they talk about the very, they're actually vocally and actively talking about it and saying how important it is. Now, obviously, if that person goes out in the street and talks about it, nothing's going to happen to that individual. Of course not. But if a Muslim who does something very similar and talks about their utopia idea of a caliphate in the exact same way as a Plato's, Plato's idea of a benevolent dictatorship and talks about it in that way, someone who mentions and talks about a caliphate is seen as an extremist. Do we have a, some sort of lens on ourselves when we look at things in a different way based on what is familiar to us? And so, yes, we should be confident in our values. Of course we should be. But when individual liberty is another value that is vital for us, well, when half the Conservative Party voted against same-sex marriage, are they all also extremists? I will leave that up to you to think. <laughs> And, you know, the reality is that when you have this idea of extremism, um, the precursor to uh, National P uh, Policing Lead for Prevent, the precursor to Simon here, his name is Sir Peter Fahey, he talked about the risk if we start looking at extremism in this way and trying to tackle them. There is a risk that police will have to be acting and defining law, and there is a risk of a police state. That is something that Sir Peter Fahey talked about. So... What do we have to do here? We have a very broad definition of extremism. But the biggest problem here is that this broad definition, as Malia talked about earlier, as has been talked about, leads to young children in schools, in nursery schools, being looked at through this lens. Young school children who look for a prayer room are sometimes considered to be an extremist. Someone who had converted to Islam was considered to be an extremist and referred. Now, people can talk about these being exceptions, but that's not the case. This causes a massive issue within communities. And mosques are affected. There are many mosques who will be worried about the fact that if they talk to the local police on these issues, they may then be considered to be hubs of extremism. And I want to finally talk about the targeting of Muslims. Now, the channel for in, on Channel 4 News, we talked about Educate Against Hate, this website that came up. On Channel 4 News, Nikki Morgan, the Education Secretary, was asked uh, about this and said, was asked, if somebody within the school converted to a Roman Catholic, would they be considered to be at risk of radicalization? Because guess what? The, the website says that anyone who converts could be at risk of radicalization. And she said, no, of course not. It's only, she didn't say it's only Muslims, but that was the implication. Uh, and it's very clear. Gavin Robinson, who's the MP, who's an MP, he was asking why is this not used in Northern Ireland. He was told by a senior counterterrorism official, according to him, don't push this issue too far. It really is a counter-Islamic strategy. This is in Hansard. It's there. It's written. And we have a, the Home Office talking about doing a poll of just Muslims to understand what Muslims are thinking. Now, we have this idea, oh, it's not targeting Muslims. There are facts on the ground that speak differently. And we can talk about many of them later on. Money across the country is very much given on prevent based on how many Muslims are in the area. And so I'd like to end by saying that why not listen to Eliza Manningham Buller, who is the former director of the MI5, who said prevent is clearly not working. When there are individual cases, while there are projects which are doing very well, we need to be humble and understand that in reality, we need to change our approach so we can have something effective that can tackle the real threat that we all face. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much and, and for your superb um, timekeeping. Do we have a microphone anywhere or microphones that are going to be taken around? And then do we have any questions? 
Uh, if you're going to ask a question, um, we'd like to hear who you are, your organisation. If you're not comfortable saying that, then you don't have to, but we'd like to hear if you are comfortable. And if your question is directed to a particular member of the panel, then say that as well, and that way we don't have to have uh, everyone uh, feeling they need to answer everything. So, uh, yes, right, right at the back there in the, uh, the yellow shirt. Thank you. My name is Manwar Ali. I'm the chief executive of an organization called GMAS. I'm a former jihadist. I have fought in Afghanistan, Kashmir, and Burma. I have extensive experience of uh, jihadism and political Islam. My question would be, and because the time is short, uh, I really do admire what Maria said, in especially. A lot of refreshing, exciting um, information came out there. But uh, I have been working for Prevent, if you like, before becoming an interventions provider. And that's because of my faith and my understanding of Islam. And the question is, you referred to um, uh, Mr. Migdad, M M Varsi. You um, refer to caliphate as utopia, utopia idea of Islamic State. So that's my only question. To me, the Islamic State or the Khilafah is a very real idea and feeds into the mindset of a lot of people. And although we don't have a conveyor belt theory and a linear kind of progression too, it does have an impact on some people becoming radicalized in that sense. Okay, any other questions that might be linked to that one? Um, or was that rather a specialist question? Uh, okay, there was one down here, a, a lady with her hand up. Hi, my question's for Malia and Mick, Dad. Um, what do you think is the cause of people becoming terrorists? And if you don't like prevent, what would you suggest in its place in terms of actual solid suggestions? Okay, we'll have one more, uh, perhaps from that area as well, since the microphone's there. Um, the, the guy with the blue shirt with his hand up. <coughs> Hi, hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I think that was an interesting question, the last one, which was what would be in place if not. And I think, Malia, um, you're in a very good position here because we can actually take a look at how the NUS counter extremism. And the statement, we need to get rid of all Muslims or no Muslims are allowed in the country, is rightly seen as fascist and is rightly seen as a problem. But the statement, we need, um, in the ideal state, we will kill apostates, that's not a problem. In fact, that's a safe space in religious rights. And in fact, we'll even share panels with people like that. We'll even work with people like that, because that's not a problem. And it again comes to this kind of conveyor belt theory. Well, then why are we challenging anti-Muslim bigotry? Because surely it's that dehumanization to Muslims can lend itself to violence, not cause it, but lend itself. So of course, if the only thing you're looking at is fascism and not is Islamist fascism, then of course you're not going to be for a counter-extremism policy. I think it's a very unique position we have with you, Malia, because we get to see how you would deal with the issue. Thank you. Okay, well, let's, let's pause there. I think, I think Malia and Migdad, you seem to be the, the targets of all three. So um, which of you wants to, wants to go first? Malia, do you want to? I don't want to. Uh, go yeah. for it. Go for, oh, fine, okay. Um, okay, uh, starting, starting with the uh, caliphate. I, I, I'm not, obviously, I'm not saying, I, I don't think you were assuming that I was, but I'm not saying that... Uh, you know, Islamic State or, or is, is the right approach, or even I think that a, a caliphate is the right answer. I, I, I don't, I think it's, it's not the right answer. Um, what I'm trying to say is very simply that the idea of a, a utopian state based on justice is what some people consider a caliphate to be. Um, and they want the, some people want the idea that in a future, we need to have a benevolent dictator who knows what's best for us, who can create justice in the land, and that's the ideal future of what they want. That's what some people talk about. Now, the point I'm trying to make is there needs to be a very strong distinction made between an idea of justice in the future, of an, a, a benevolent future, and the craziness that is happening in Syria. They are two entirely different things from most people's perspective. Of course, there is a small minority who will say that this craziness there is the way towards that purest state. And I agree, for those people, there is a very different approach that needs to be taken. But we cannot merge everything together where there are so many Muslims in this country who may have an idea of, oh, actually, no, not Muslims, those of many faiths who talk about a future state of um, bliss and, and everything being happy and good. That is okay for someone to have, even if they happen to be Muslim. 
Uh, that, that's my core point that I wanted to make. Um, and just related to the second point, um, I, I, it's, to talk about an alternative, I think if maybe Mali can talk about it, it's a huge topic. Uh, directly on the issue to do with um, Islamophobia and whether you know, it's not a problem because it might not lead to violence. I, I agree that we shouldn't be talking about a conveyor belt in theory if there is no evidence to suggest it. What my worry is, is when 37% of the British population would support policies to reduce the number of Muslims in the UK, we have a problem. My issue is not it's a counter-terror problem, it's not. It's a community cohesion problem. It's the fact that we need to be able to work together as people and be able to work in society. When you have this entrenched Islamophobia within so many people, in fact, it's the, the Baroness Warsi talked about it, there being a simmering underbelly of Islamophobia in the government. A simmering underbelly of Islamophobia in the government who's in, instituting policies in this issue. Now, when the people who are instituting policies, when the people in public, 37% of that public, are delivering these, well, guess what? You're going to have a policy that's likely to discriminate against Muslims in its actualization. It is a natural consequence of the way that the approach ha happens. Uh, I'd love to talk about the uh, uh, alternatives, but I think right. I will Mom, be yeah. Let me go. Um, okay, so to, to answer the question around, um, you know, what, what is leading people to, to, to kind of uh, taking certain actions, joining these groups, uh, um, and... Yeah, and, and wanting to kind of inflict any kind of violence, I'd say it surrounds the political climate in which we're in. People, why, we need to start asking why are people feeling so incredibly desperate that they have to take such actions, um, that, that they're not necessarily in a space um, where, where such ideas are like harnessed or encouraged from the second they enter the education system, you might say. So what is leading particularly young people to feel so incredibly disempowered uh, that they have, that they're left with no choice uh, but to, 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 to kind of go after Syria or join certain groups. And I'd also say that um, we have to look at mass unemployment, the fact that education is being privatised and rendered ever inaccessible, youth centres have been closed down, every service available uh, to support young people to allow a space of, of critical thought and development has been shut down by the state. Uh, and further to that, our foreign policy. Uh, and the space in which we can discuss and be critical of through the prevent strategy are, are, are being monitored and ever watched so even the utterance of discontent is being policed and criminalized so if you want to look at the problem it's we have to look at the state's hand and and uh you know the international events that, that relate to that um in terms of if not prevent them, what? Well, preferably something that isn't based on racial profiling, that isn't based on stigmatizing a community, that isn't based on rendering council services, welfare services, uh, spaces of spying, of distrust, um, and ones that actually address the root of the problem, as opposed to, again, uh, placing blame on, on what to some uh, are considered um, a community that, that is actually a victim uh, of those very events and the policies that follow. Um, and in relation to the point about fascism, I, I couldn't totally make out the question, but naturally I'm opposed to all forms of fascism in whatever uh, uh, way you choose to, to kind of uh, define it. And um, within NUS, we have a very clear ethical framework. We have, uh, we, you know, we, we implement uh, such tactics as safe spaces and, and no platforming for the purpose of ensuring that there is no airtime for any sort of fascist thoughts. And I just. Leave Sorry, it. because you said I didn't really tell the question very well, just very quickly. Sorry, I, I think you've asked your question. There's a lot of people here. Well, you said I didn't really answer well, it. Um, but can I? Have you got a very quick clarification? Very, very quick clarification. Fascists, anti-Muslim fascists get banned. Islamist extremists who say things like apostate should be killed in the ideal state can't even be challenged, otherwise you claim it's racist and Islamophobic. Do you not see that? Do you not see that distinction? That one statement that says uh, Muslims should be banned Another statement that says apostates should be killed, and they're completely separate. This is a separate form of fascism as well. Okay, okay, you make Thank a point. Mali, do you want to come back quickly on that? Or should we go? Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah. Yes, do you want to say who you are? Yeah. Sorry, I was so eager to ask the question. So, I'm Haydar Zeki from Rights Debate. And we believe that speakers who are high risk, who are from extremists, yeah, should be challenged by civil dialogue, debate, and discussion. Yeah? Now, obviously, we don't believe in banning any legal speaker. Okay, so I'll explain myself, and thank you very much. Okay, right, that's enough from you and from you. Malia, do you, wanna, do you want to uh, answer that very quickly, or I think, Simon, you wanted a quick word? 
Sure. You may feel you've yeah, answered it yeah, already. I, I do feel I've answered it. And, and again, like uh, as an organization, as a union, it's our responsibility to not give airtime to any kind of fascist uh, and, and, and airtime to any kind of hatred views that are going to lead to a shutting down of the debate and like not addressing the issues or even proposing solutions around it. So, and, and I totally stand by those policies. I don't know if I'm totally misunderstanding the question. But right. Well, I want to move on to another group of questions, but Simon, I think you said you wanted a very quick word on this one. I, I, just, I mean, I mean, the first point, obviously, it's quite a striking introduction to a start by saying I'm a former jihadist. Um, <laughs> And there's just look, this is a policey thing. I'm just kind of struck that there are parallels between some aspects of the things that make people feel alienated and outside that roll back into, for me, a past with guns and gangs and the things that worked. And some of the things that worked with guns and gangs were not people like me saying, don't do this, do that, do the other. It was people who had a history and experience in that world and talked about what they reflected on looking back. Um, and the point about, well, what do you do instead? You know, I would say it, wouldn't I? We do need something now, because there's 2,000 referrals a quarter heading to prevent teams at the moment. More of those are from outside policing and prisons than from within. And as Marley has quietly said, 10% from communities. Um, and, you know, either that's a huge success because it's a significant increase or, as, as you kind of inferred, it's not that many. But there are 2,000 referrals a quarter rolling in. As a consequence of them rolling in, about half of them result in something happening that heads towards people such as yourself. So, you know, we do need something now. And in terms of what works... It could actually be people who've walked a path before talking about what they've learnt and whether they would take a different path. Might be something that would really work very effectively and actually is working in some cases. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go to a different corner of the of the room. Um, again, I remind you, please say who you are if you if you would like to. Say who your question is addressed to, and I'd say to the speakers, keep the answers short. We're not really on question time. We're we're, uh, we're, we're trying to answer. Questions. So, should we go to this corner? There's, there's a lady on the back row there um, behind you. Hi, all. Um, thank you for that um, interesting discussion. Um, so, my question, or my opinion, I guess, um, just like to get your opinions on it, is that obviously there's little doubt in this room that um, our government should be tackling and engage in the prevention of extremism. Um, but surely the sensible thing to do is to tackle those factors that inspire the extension, the external and the internal. Um, an example of that, I know McDad touched up on it, is the most obvious external factor is Saudi Arabia. Yet our government continues to treat Saudi Arabia as its closest ally. Um, so I would just like to know what you think should be done in terms of putting pressure on our government to stop such um, relationships. I think my personal opinion is that that is the wider picture and that is the root cause. And I okay. think that's what you have to tackle. Okay, well, so. we've, we've got your comment. It's, maybe it's more of a foreign policy comment than a comment for the prevent experts, but it's been heard. And if people want to pick it up, they will. But let's have a couple more as well. Um, yeah, there's someone waving a hand there uh, rather desperately, again, on the back row. Uh, <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, thank you to the panel. Um, I'm actually going to, uh, sorry, my name is Mohammed. Um, I work with CAMPAC, that's Campaign Against Criminalizing Communities. Um, I want to pick up from the last statement that you just made about foreign policy being separate from prevent. Um, Donald Rumsfeld, former Secretary of Defense, uh, uh, requested a report about why does they hate us. Um, was, was the main question. And within the report, it said quite clearly, um, people in the Muslim world don't hate us because of our freedoms, they hate us because of our policies, including our foreign policies. Um, I'm just wondering what any of you would like to say to address the fact that, given the fact that terrorism is typically defined as the use of violence against civilians to achieve a political goal, um, and that people who are now called terrorists were supported, say, by the British state in Yugoslavia or in Afghanistan. So they weren't terrorists then, they were freedom fighters, and they were militants, um, and that was perfectly illegal, including, by the way, Syria, when it, when it first kicked off in Syria, because the goal was the overthrow of the Assad regime. 
So they weren't terrorists. They were people going off to liberate the Syrian people. Now they're terrorists. So how is it that you see a prevent program which considers opposition to UK foreign policy? Um, how is it that you see that foreign policy is perhaps goes to the root cause of politically motivated violence rather than being a separate issue altogether? Okay, thanks very much. We'll have one more, but I mean, maybe Anjum might ask you to lead off on, on the extent to which foreign policy is, is an issue maybe that you have to deal with in your work through PREVENT. But have we got any other questions? There's someone standing right at the back. Sorry, hi. Um, my name's Lee. I'm a teacher from Bradford. Um, I've been down for another project actually today and I heard about you, so I've come along and it's been really interesting listening to quite a lot of your views. My question is, because um, quite a lot of you have, have talked in different ways, and I must admit I do agree that I think it is a community cohesion point of view. Um, there's, I'm not saying that prevent is perfect, that there, there's issues with it. Um, however, what my question to you guys is, how would you promote, or how do you think we should promote the community cohesion aspect more so that we are not promoting the prejudice, which is currently happening in prevent? Okay, thanks very much. Well, good to have a, a question from a teacher. I mean, is there anyone else with, you know, maybe school? Yes, you in the, in the cap at the front here. Um, I think what the panel um, failed to address is what students on the ground actually face. You talk about um, the, policy, um, the policy of it, but what students on the ground actually face. My friends and I were targeted uh, for simply talking about Palestine for saying the word terrorism in class, for asking if the food was made in Israel, uh, for simply caring about the Palestinian struggle, which I think should resonate with every level-headed human being. Uh, my friend completely withdrew from politics. He withdrew from humanitarian activism. He withdrew from actually being my friend because his parents said that Rahman is too radical for you. Um, so this is, is what hap this is what is happening. People are becoming quiet and alienated. Aren't, aren't they the, the, the very symptoms of, of, and causes of radicalization? And, and Anjum, you, you mentioned that it's only a handful of bad cases. Students are scared of talking about prevent and what the experiences they've had in fear of being referred again to prevent. That is what is happening on the ground. It's all well that you sit there and the panel sit there saying that prevent is working fine and it's a utopia. Nothing is going wrong with prevent, uh, but, but it's not. So my question is, how can we stop what happened to my friend um, happening to many Muslim students up and down the country? Can I ask how old you and your friend were when? Um, we were 15, and 15 at the 15. time. 15, okay. Yeah, well, you can, but is there, can we have just one more um, question connected with schools, perhaps, before we, before we move on? Um, yes, there's a gentleman uh, in glasses with his left hand up, right in the middle. My name is Barry Bishop. I represent no organisation. Um, when a child is arrested, uh, the parents uh, have to be informed and uh, there needs to be an appropriate adult present to support the child during questioning by the police. Now, I am very concerned when I read reports of children being interviewed by prevent personnel without their parents being informed. I suggest that any interviews desired by prevent personnel should be by prior appointment so that arrangements can be made for the child to be supported during the interview by its parents and or some other adult chosen uh, by the, uh, the parents. Do the panellists agree? Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to you first, um, Anjum, yeah. um, and let's, let's keep them as short as we can. Sure. I don't feel you have to answer I, every question. I think one of the uh, concerns I have and I feel about Prevent is that it's been scaled up too quickly. And then when you spread out into schools without skilling people, understanding the nuances between different forms of injustice in Palestine and, and the concept of Daesh, people don't always differentiate that on the school level with new teachers coming from areas where there are not understanding of Islam and other concepts, so that it gets blurred. And I think when you have a lot of recruitment of staff within Prevent, I've seen that cheap people turning over two years in the post, move to another post, new police have come again. You're having to retrain people on the job so they don't 
make presumptions about people's views and ideas. And I think where it works well is where I've seen staff retained for periods of five, six years, and I can work with the same police officer. Where it doesn't work is when new people come into the post and have to learn again about concept of Islam, concepts about justice and injustice, and then you're starting again. And there's a lot of the cases we do work with, we try to close them early and say, look, this is not, it's not happening, don't even bother, We're not, I wouldn't even take this. So we do a lot of work behind the scenes to prevent those sort of cases coming across. And the ones we do take is ones where we say, actually, I can see this, you can see it, and let's do it. So there probably are, I could say, quite a majority that we don't take on. I can't say what, when you... Sorry? So all these cases that are coming through the Conveyables, which have no bearing or no sound in terms of drawing power, shouldn't be taken on board. So if it's a false positive, the whole policy is false. Because you're not taking these cases through to channel program because they're not merited. Mm. But the policy in itself is selecting all these individuals and saying put them through the channel and then make your decisions. So the whole policy in itself is a failed policy. It doesn't give you any yeah, I mean, that's enough. I, I think for a start, you haven't got a microphone. I think we've got the point. You think it's a false it's, policy. It's, it's Andrew, not, do you want to add to that? I'll give you an example. When there was tragic death of baby P, you'll see a spike in referrals to child protection, right? When, you have a, when something happens, people refer because it becomes aware in the public conscious and personal conscious. So you get a spike, and then things calm down again until another, something else happens. This is an ebb and flow you have within a social system. And social care is not a science. It's a trying to be a science. So we work with what we have. OK, right. This is not a discussion. Uh, these are questions to the panel. We've only had one answer so far. Would any of the others on the panel? Simon, do you want to uh, come back on the question of whether an appropriate person ought to be yeah, present yeah. when someone's uh, questioned? I, I mean, ba basically, yes. But there's now a big but. And the big but is... You can't have the people in the room, probably, if they are the concern. And that is where we get into a really difficult issue, because in principle, I, I'm a parent. The thought that someone would be talking to my child, uh, children, about something really important that I didn't know would upset me. But of course, the challenge is, in some of these cases, the very person who you might most obviously turn to may well be the person where the concern is. And I was... This morning, I don't know if you shared it with all of us on the panel, you did a lecture, the Magna Carta lecture or some such. Certainly you did. Yeah, which, which touched on a case where a family court has taken a child into care as a consequence of concerns around the well-being for that child. So, in principle, yes, and you're quite right. If someone was arrested, and obviously this is not about people being arrested... But the challenge with some of this is it's really complicated because the person you might most obviously have there might not be the most appropriate person to be there at that point. That is not dissimilar, of course, from some of the other issues around child sexual exploitation and violence in homes and all those other things <coughs> that appear when we, the police and others in the room, are dealing with young people and trying to support young people. Right, Mick Dad, I think you wanted to come in. Yeah, <clears throat> we have to look at the, quickly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the consequences of this are very often the shutting down of that public debate. Young children right now are sometimes very scared of being open and saying what they think on foreign policy issues because they're worried they might be referred. And that's something that's very, very important and we can't under... Like, this means that the very values that we talk about about democracy are being undermined because individuals can't speak out. Um, mosques, in mosques now, many mosques are worried, and the imams in those mosques are worried to talk about foreign policy-related issues because they think that might result in some problems for that mosque. Now, how, what does that mean for individuals? It means those individuals in that mosque don't necessarily get their understanding of foreign policy from a mosque which is seen as a place of worship, which is very normally reasonable in the way it works. In fact, they get their thinking from online and other places. So what we need to do is create those safe spaces and not criminalize the, or, or not necessarily criminalize, but mean that some people feel that they can't speak out. Young children, I've had people who've come to me and said, I think I want to homeschool my children because I'm worried that they're going to be taking, taken away at school or something's going to happen to them. After Paris, they were told, 
Parents were telling their children, don't speak out about what you think on this issue because of what might happen to you. Just, th this, is, this is happening to hundreds, thousands of people across the country. So it is not exceptional. This is happening, uh, that, whereas before the prevent became a duty within schools, a lot of people may not have known about prevent really. Now it is consistent, constant, and very, very real to so many people that, that people are worried about their very children. And that's a problem. Okay. Quickly, Maria, yeah, I'll quickly just come up on the point at the back that, that hasn't been answered yet. I'd say, you know, amplify the voices calling out the hypocrisy, but also help repeal this policy, which is attempting to shut down spaces of increased accountability and where we can actually mobilize and hold uh, and, and call out the government for those double standards and further to that, organize around and create spaces of critical thought that allow us to, to, to kind of challenge them and to think, actually, this is not what we should be doing as a nation. Um, in terms of the community cohesion um, question, I'd say that um, uh, oppose the state's attempts to pit communities against one another. The prevent agenda is particularly targeting and demonizing Muslims, it is legitimizing Islamophobia, it is a state-sponsored Islamophobia, for God's sake. That alone is a good way that you can unite all communities to root it out and say, well, actually, we, we cannot accept this uh, um, wherever it props up. Fighting the government cuts, that means people are scrambling for small pots of money and blaming the other community for having hogged what little funding already exists. Uh, uprooting xenophobic anti-migrant views that the refugees are the problem or the Muslims are the problem and really taking on those narratives from a very young age. Those are real ways that create community cohesion that do not need some big mass uh, uh, engineering, uh, uh, engineered project by the state that is actually looking to capitalize on community divisions. Okay. Um, sorry, and then, yeah. and then just a very quick aspect of like your point, uh, <coughs> repeal, prevent, and it's been around, you know, I'd argue it, it developed in 2006. We've seen the effects of it so far. We are not seeing the fruits of its supposed labor. If anything, we're seeing uh, it drive a wedge even further uh, uh, between even internally within the Muslim community and, and further legitimize a form of oppression. So yeah, I'd say like quite bluntly repeal the, we have to work to repeal the strategy. Okay, round three, uh, we're going to concentrate down here, there's some people. Um, can I just say to the speakers, you're going to be given a minute each at the oh, end right. to say anything that you think is really important. So don't feel you've got to answer everything now. Um, I'm going to start, if we can bring the microphone down here. Um, there's a chap in a beard in the third row. Uh, thank you for noticing. Um, the thought, my name is Cal Courtney and I'm the head of uh, student engagement and success at the London School of Business and Management. My division is responsible for making sure we adhere to our prevent duty. The thought just struck me as an Irish Roman Catholic that I should hand my child over to an agent of the state if his or her interpretation of the Catholic faith was wrong. And that that in some way is the role of the state makes me feel very uneasy. I think for anyone with a, with a background in, in history and in the teaching of history, we will know that Islam has within its DNA and has done for over a thousand years uh, more than enough uh, cop on and intelligence to embed the principles of critical uh, engagement with the world very well into its young people. And all we need to do is look at the difference between tolerance in Islamic societies and Christian societies up until the modern day, to know that Islam has been a much more hospitable, open and tolerant religion than Christianity has ever been. And my question is, why do we allow this role? And how has this happened in our so-called inclusive uh, country uh, filled with British values. How have we allowed it to happen that Islam has been ignored, that we've listened to a Daily Mail interpretation of Islam to say that it's incapable of training its young people to be tolerant uh, and kind? Because that's always been my experience. It's my experience every day with our Muslim students. It's my experience every day with my Muslim colleagues. And wh wh why do we let that happen? Why are we saying that Islam is incapable of doing that? Gentleman in the front row in the black shirt. Yeah, hi, I, I work as a prevent coordinator, so I train the teachers. I'm going to make a really bold assumption here that no one on the panel thinks that young children being groomed to terrorism is a good thing and that we should safeguard them. Early intervention, which is what safeguarding is. Safeguarding is the bread and butter 
of our teaching staff. They're the people we entrust our children with every single day. And I am not going to entrust my child to a school that picks and chooses which area of safeguarding it is going to apply. It's either safeguarding or not safeguarding, and prevent is part of safeguarding. Okay. Um, just behind, uh, the man just behind you. Thank you. Uh, Glyn Secker. Uh, director and Executive Committee member of Jews for Justice for Palestinians. Uh, I've got a question for uh, Simon Cole. Um, in the police training manual, you use the EMCU definition of anti-Semitism, which is not actually a formal definition in the, in the United Nations uh, documentation, in, in its organization. It's not, it's not credited anymore. It was issued as guidelines, but it doesn't have any substance, formal status. And uh, you, as an organization, the police are involved in liaising with schools in terms of prevent, and we have been invited to talk in schools because Palestine societies have been refused invitations. The, the, an invitation goes from a school, uh, from a teacher, uh, up through the hierarchy in the school, and the invitations are declined. Now, Palestine societies are legal, civil organizations that abide by the law, and they promulgate legal reactions, legal measures that people should take uh, for justice for Palestinians, but there's a concern in schools when they are asked to talk. And so we have been asked to right. talk can, in can schools you, can you come as, to a question, yes, uh, uh, as, uh, as a Jewish organisation, but now we are being refused opportunities to talk in schools. And it's this closing down of debate that I'm extremely concerned of, and my question is, what are you going to do about it? Right, OK. Uh, let's pass it to your next door neighbour. Uh, Carl Allen, I'm a pensioner, but because of my appearance, I'm occasionally asked questions. My appearance, but not my religion. I am occasionally asked questions by students. And what, what I've gathered is two things. One, when we say prevent, and you get on that list, all the students are saying, am I on that list forever and ever? Two, we say channel, and I'm telling you, as much as you say confidential, confidential never meant invisible. So there's no confidential in that channel as far as the older students realize. They are not, the students are getting very smart about the longer term effects of the program. And after a while, there is that problem that the entire program will dry up because students are beginning to calculate the longer term effects to which none of you, none of the prevent people have applied any thought. Okay, thank you. There's a lady behind there in the, in the, the white top. Sky. Two rows back. Hey, um, my question is, you keep mentioning that prevent is voluntary and to engage with the strategy is voluntary, but our experience on the ground has been that if people don't want to engage with prevent, then that's actually seen a sign of further symptoms of radicalization. So what, what's your experience? Um, in terms, if people don't want to engage... No, no, but you said your experience on the ground. I just wondered, are you... Are you oh, so, um, this was actually before Prevent in its current form. This was when Prevent was back around. Um, are, you, are you a teacher or a, or a... No, sorry, this is when I was a student I see, at university. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was my friends as part of the Islamic Society. They were asked, they were actually sent emails, their emails went out, and they were asked to come and talk to these people and voice their concerns about foreign policy. It was literally an invitation, come and tell us about your concerns about foreign policy. Um, and suddenly we had people that wanted to come to our talks, our events that were being held, and they wanted to... Um, Engaging in dialogue is not a bad thing, but having people turn up and trying to get into every aspect of your life and then being told that if you don't engage with us, there's actually a sign that you're being further radicalized. 
that's a danger. I mean, so you keep emphasizing that prevent is voluntary, but actually not engaging goes against you. So it can't be. Okay. Right. I think these, uh, these questions are so interesting, I'm, I'm going to let them run a bit. I'm going to extend the final one minute to a final two minutes, so you can answer them all in your two minutes. But for the time being, we're going to move up this way again. There's some very determined questioners. There's a lady with, in the red with her hand up, and then there's a gentleman in the blue tie, and we'll take those two. Hello, good evening. My name is Hannah Shalash, and I am um, affiliated with the Quilliam Foundation, amongst other secular organisations. Um, my father is actually from Syria, and he's from... An, uh, no, he's not from, but our tribe is from um, an area that's now actually controlled by Daesh. So for me, it is pers very, very personal. And any, I'm very upset and appalled that there are some of my fellow Britons who have gone to Syria to victimise and... Um, you know, hurt and possibly kill people there. Um, and we've had lots of quest, um, talk on the panel about reasons why people might want to go by being dissatisfied by pol foreign policy or um, dissatisfied by the way things are going with the government. Do you accept any sort of ideological reason why someone might want to go? And do you also accept that they have responsibility for themselves as well and those around them have responsibility to intercept if they have suspicions? Okay, and then the gentleman in the blue tie. Harry Rushworth, I'm a student trainer and I sit on the learning and teaching committees at the University of Bath. Um, personally, I believe that the best way to challenge an extreme view is to hear it and then prove why it's wrong, not to completely ignore it. And um, I think you said earlier, Malia, that one of your main concerns with prevent is that it's uh, adamant, it's almost censorship of certain ways of thought. But then you also just said today that you won't share a platform or you won't allow some fascist speakers to speak. So aren't you completely undermining your opposition to prevent by requesting censorship, but only on your terms? Okay, well, I think Malia will want to address those last two questions in her final words. Um, I think we'll take this one more. There's a man in the third row back here. Uh, Rob Ferguson from Newham NUT, a teacher in East London, an area with um, obviously a very high population of uh, Muslim students in our schools and college. And I want to address a question around this issue of the closing down of space for free expression. And I think there's a relationship here between the targeting of individuals like Rahman in front of me and the language, the narrative of extremism, which is like you can never pin it down. It will drop on people's heads from above in the most arbitrary fashion. And I don't think that's an accident. I think it's intentional. Because extremism, you can pick and choose who you define to be an extremist. I saw a resource, and it's a typical resource, from Leicester, under the Respect Programme. I was looking at it this afternoon. I thought it was a disgrace in pedagogical terms. There were half a dozen characters relating a prevent narrative, no alternative, no challenge, as if that was the narrative to accept. And a student fees protest was highlighted with a broken window right. as it, an example it, of extremism. Is this a question? The question is this. Right that we have students who are telling us that they will not raise controversial issues in the classroom. They might talk to some people about it in the mosque. We have Muslim teachers saying they will not talk in prevent sessions in front of their colleagues. We have people who've been identified by prevent, referred to channel, who feel they've got no alternative and walk away Right, are you going to ask fear. a question? Oh. How the question is this, how can you justify and try and pretend that this experience isn't real? That it's just an accident, that it's just a minority, that it's just a few, that it's not built in to the prevent narrative itself? Right. Okay, that's it for the questions. That's it for the questions. But before I ask the speakers uh, to sum up in one or two minutes each and, and answer anything they've heard or anything that was directed to them, I'd just like to do a, a little experiment. And I was, I was handed a leaflet uh, as I walked in, 
Uh, it says prevent dividing communities and threatening civil liberties. And then I thought of another phrase, which we've, we've heard as well, prevent a necessary part of safeguarding policy. And I'd just like to sort of take a show of hands. If you had to choose one of those phrases <laughs> to describe prevent, would it be dividing communities and threatening civil liberties, or would it be a necessary part of safeguarding policy? So let's start with dividing communities and threatening civil liberties. Okay, how about a necessary part of safeguarding policy? Okay, well, it's a, it's a substantial minority, I think, might be a kind way of putting it. Um, but at least now the speakers know, uh, know the audience they're dealing with. Um, I don't know which, uh, now we know who you are. Uh, which uh, order? We, uh, are we happy to go in the same order as before? Yeah. Right, Simon, go ahead. Uh, okay, look, I'm going to try and quickly pick up. Um, if there's an issue with the definition, then please we'll talk afterwards and we'll sort it out. There's a really interesting thing, and you've got quite agitated and pointed at me. With, with all the love in the world, we've never met. <laughs> um, I'm not a teacher. I'm a cop. <laughs> you, teachers, and st you set the tone of what goes on in a classroom, not me. I'm not there. I last went to school 30-odd years ago. <laughs> so I do think there's a really interesting thing there, because you got quite, you were quite pointy. And I'm sitting there thinking, I think, he's, I think, why is he pointing at me? I don't even, you know, so I think there's a really interesting issue there. Um, uh, I don't personally believe, I mean, the most powerful thing I've had said to me in recent months was by someone from the local community where I am who said, I think I've been doing prevent for 40 odd years because I've run a madrasa where we've talked about how people <coughs> should be with each other and with other people. So I kind of, I think I probably agree with you. Um, and then just some bullet points which are bigger, you know, I personally don't believe in any sphere of what I do as a cop, we should just let people romp and challenge towards criminalising themselves and harming other people. And that's really difficult because of the kind of things that we deal with, but I just don't think it, you know, my sort of values, if that's not right, so we need to be doing something. And really then, what would I say? The concept that you can't say prevent has or hasn't worked is really interesting because this is like the great dilemma of policing. How do you know that anything I've done today in my police force has reduced crime? How do you really know that you've stopped stuff that you don't know you've stopped? So that's a kind of familiar dilemma for me. This is safeguarding. <coughs> it is voluntary and I'd be really interested in who the they were who made it seem that your friends were, you know, by saying, oh, it's been not complying therefore be really interesting it's got to be done with you know that is the abiding message the safeguarding the putting arms around people has got to be done with and I would say it wouldn't I there is I think agreement there is a real risk there is a real threat these difficult issues will define us collectively and we've got to find a way to go forwards that safeguards people who otherwise may harm themselves, their families, and the wider community. Mali? Yeah, um, I think also partially in response to that, uh, I do know what it has done, and it's rendered <coughs> children criminals for making spelling mistakes because they happen to be from a particular faith group or ethnic group. It has made uh, spaces uh, such as our students' unions, uh, um, an expansion of, of our police state, and so on and so forth. There, there is much, much evidence to prove how prevent is not working uh, in, in what is presented to us as, as its intentions. Um, I'd say that um, in, in response to your question as well, that um, the, the reason that that narrative is, is allowed and is getting the reach that it does is because you have a, the government pushing a policy that essentially trains people to internalize those thoughts and that further legitimizes it it's, and institutionalizes it across every <coughs> single sector. That, that is the statement between. That is how an, a, an incredibly Islamophobic and Orientalist view uh, um, and hateful view of Islam and Muslims in general is allowed uh, in our society. Uh, and I'd just say that um, uh, in response to the question up there as well, um, you know, those arguments are already out there, but the differences between what you're suggesting, grassroots organizations, community groups, institutions, implementing democratically a policy um, in comparison to the state uh, enforcing upon us 
um, rendering a, a, a policy which renders our educators, our doctors, our dentists, spies and complicit in their policies uh, is quite different with, again, no uh, democratic space, uh, no space for accountability or transparency uh, and, and definitely not uh, uh, in a democratic fashion. And I just end on the, uh, the note that, you know, the only measures by which prevent uh, can be deemed successful uh, are in deepening divisions in society, institutionalizing discrimination against Muslims, outlawing dissent and free thinking, and uh, undermining our civil liberties. Um, and, and some have argued that the failure, failures which we've outlined uh, are simply regrettable side effects or they've been totally dodged. Um, but a policy which stigmatizes the community and undermines basic political rights and breaks up relationships of welfare and trust in our public institutions is always a failure. As citizens, we deserve equal civil liberties and equal liberties. And as a union, the NUS is committed to keep campaigning for exactly that. Thank you for listening. To me. <laughs> What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at it from a perspective of a young person, Muslim. When I grew up in this country as a young Muslim, we didn't have this existential extremist threat out there. We didn't really have, you know, we were, we were more worried about cricket and food and playing football. I feel sorry for young people growing up in a modern society. The concept of the Daesh sitting out there, Al-Qaeda, all these extremist groups, the far root. I don't know where their space they go for, to, to address it. They do come to us, we do have them within channel, but there has to be other spaces, and I agree with that. Talking about foreign policy, I get more of the discussion of foreign policy with adults than I get with young people. Young people are more looking for a meaning for their life and the definition of what Islam means for them. They're told between, this is haram, this is shirk, this is bidah, this is kuffar. They're, they're left with no space to manoeuvre in <coughs> between their societies, between people and the role models. They don't know where to manoeuvre in that space. Can I shake hands with this woman? Can I not shake hands with her? Can I be friends with her? They're stuck. They don't know where to move. We need to have a more open discussion with young people where they can be themselves. Regarding prevent strategy, I see prevent, and I knew there used to be community cohesion, and I see more prevent now than community cohesion. I think there needs to be a bit more resources on community cohesion side, because things which were originally in community <coughs> cohesion are now slightly spilling into prevent. And I think that's a problem. I think... I mean, it might be a financial problem, but I think also we've put a lot of effort into prevent. I think we need to be putting more, more effort into community cohesion. And thinking about, you know, how this means for people's lives, as well as th risk, threat, and civil society. But I think, you know, what, what young people like what we work with, the fun has gone out of being Muslim sometimes. And I think we need to bring some of that back and look at some of the culture that we've lost, you know. And we're talking about extremism and bombings and blowing things <coughs> up and... What happened to cricket and, you know, just <laughs> things that didn't matter, you know, eating food and stuff, it's gone. I feel sorry for them. It's, it's terrible, you know, and I understand why people are frustrated by it. And I think, you know, injustice for Palestine is getting over, you know, sidelined and marginalised by the concept of the Daesh and all these other, you know, forms of extremism. And I think, well, where, 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 where is that, where is that gone for people? Where is that the right to people to say, you know, this is not right? And this is not right, but I don't know. I don't know about this. Where can I talk about it? Sometimes they, we, we talk with them, but this has to be other spaces for that to happen. Okay. I think that's where we're going to go with it. Okay. Make that two minutes. Thank you. Um, look, right now there is such a wide range of issues that are being dealt with. We, the real threat of people going to Syria is a real one. Let's tackle it. Let's look at the specific issues that are worrying. Rather than if someone wants to has an issue with their language, learning English is now under this rubric of countering extremism. Or if you somehow um, have a view on boycotting or divesting or sanctions on Israel, BDS. If suddenly that means you're more likely to be an extremist, these types of pro these are very wide problems that cause many issues within Muslim communities and wider society. We need to have that civil space because what happens when you do this is that mosques, even within mosques, I know a mosque where one group won the election and guess what? The other group said, these guys are extremists. Just imagine within a mosque election, one group is calling the other extremists and guess what the response was? No, you guys are extremists. Uh, I mean, seriously, this idea of extremism has pervaded society in so many ways. Oh, in schools, in mosques, it's going everywhere. And the state should not be the determinant of what is a good or a bad Muslim. That needs to be done at local level. The idea that has been mentioned by Anjum about people, you know, they need to have a space of what, what is good Islam. And, and the fact that 
this shirk and bid'ah. Of course that should be done, but it should not be done by the state. It's empowering civil society. And that's what we need. We need the government to realize and talk to Muslim communities. They don't talk to the Muslim Council of Britain. They don't talk to us because we are potentially extremists, I'm sorry. Um, look, this is the reality that we live in. That the government's not talking to Muslims, but wants to impose things on Muslims. That in reality, we have a, a, a policy of, of conveyor belt theory of extremism, which isn't evidence-based. It isn't working in, no, they don't apply prevent in Northern Ireland. And at the same time, the idea of mental health that Simon Cole so very powerfully talked about to, to the Guardian, that half the people who are being radicalized in the UK, according to the study that, he, he, that has been done, half of them have mental health issues. Yet, we don't have anywhere near the resource put to tackle that. So what we need is more money going into mental health, more money going to the police and not prevent, and so that community cohesion work can happen. Because guess what, in mosques, Rather than uh, mosques talking to police officers on normal issues, now the community part of policing has gone down and the, the, the money going to police has gone down to such an extent that if you want to talk about lo normal interfaith events in your local mosque, you somehow will be talking to not the normal police, but guess what? The counter-terror police. That's the way that ca the counter-terrorism policies have pervaded society. And we need to change that entirely so that we can have stronger communities and we have effective policy to try and tackle the real threat of people going to Syria, of real threats of people blowing themselves up here in the UK. Thank you. An American judge once wrote about the power of reason as applied through public discussion. I think we've had some emotion here as well. Um, but we've had reason, and most importantly, we've had a discussion from a lot of very different viewpoints. I'd like to thank, and I'd like you to thank, uh, Malia, Anjum, uh, and, 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 and Mikdad, and Simon for really putting themselves on the line, putting it out there. Uh, and thank you as well for, for, for being a great audience and for all your contributions. Thank David for carrying it so well and your old advisor too for our special round of applause.